Welcome to South Cedo Paranormal. It is Thursday, March 17th, 2022. And today I'll be doing another book review episode uh, featuring a couple of short stories from a complete fiction of H.P. Lovecraft. As always, to find episodes of the show, links to social media, ways to donate, and other ways to contact me. You can visit the podcast page, which is salcedoparanormal.podbean.com. That's S-A-L-S-I-D-O, paranormal.podbean.com. Always happy to hear from you all, whether you have comments or questions or topic suggestions, or you have stories of experiences you'd like to share, uh, whether they're your own or others you trust. All those can be sent to me. Um, you can either write them in or you can uh, contact me and we can arrange to have you on the show. Uh, thank you all for listening as always, whether you're here live for the stream or you listen to the uh, podcast or YouTube feed. I appreciate all the support. So, um, I have two stories here that uh, I've recently listened to, and um, I'm going to review them. There will be spoilers, but the good thing is these are not um, terribly recent publications, so I think it should be hopefully okay. Uh, again, there will be spoilers, so, but also just keep in mind with these reviews and these uh, descriptions and discussions of these stories and how they relate to the paranormal. There's so much more detail in any given story than what I can provide here. So, um, so I definitely encourage everyone to go check out the, it's called, um, the book I have is called H.P. Lovecraft, The Complete Fiction. Um, but I'm sure there's probably different versions out there. And, and um, so I'm, I'm just slowly working through that and then mixing in other uh, books that I've read along the way um in fact the, uh, my plan for next thursday is to review a couple more stephen king novels um that are basically almost like little well they're, they're basically novels that have sequels so they're not uh, i'll review two novels that follow the same character or characters through different points in time um, so that's the plan for next Thursday. We've got a couple of those books picked out. But, um, today we are, like I said, sticking with, uh, with Lovecraft. So this first story, um, that I want to talk about is called The Haunter of the Dark. And, um, so the story takes place in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and it centers around uh, a character named Robert Blake, who was a, a writer uh, with an interest in the occult. And um, he notices this, this in the city, I guess he just moves into, he notices this, um, this, this large um, church that is apparently abandoned. Um, and it's on a hill. It's it's called Federal Hill, and you can see uh, from his from his home on the on the east side of the city. Um, he research he kind of researches the area, and um, finds out more about the tr the history of the church, which um, at one point was kind of taken over by. A cult called the Church of Starry Wisdom, and uh, it's said by a lot of people in the area area to be haunted. Um, so, eventually, after just being drawn, his eyes being drawn to this church over and over again at, at night, um, he decides to visit this church, and he's kind of warned off by locals along the way a couple of different locals are along the way but um he's just so fascinated by it and interested in it 
that um, he finds a way in. He actually has to um, go in through a window leading into, the, I believe it was the basement, um, to get into the church because the main doors are closed, they're locked. So eventually he finds, um, he goes up to the tower in the church, which is the part that he's seen from his own home. And um, that's where he finds uh, the, the skeletal remains of another man, uh, Edwin M. L. Lilbridge, Lilybridge, or something like that, who was a reporter who disappeared in 1893. Now this story, um, a lot of these stories take place in the um, early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s. Um, and along with this, this man's remains, Blake also finds an ancient stone artifact known as the, the Shining Trapezohedron, which has this ability to um, basically let's see here. Okay, um, it's basically almost like a um, portal, or it contains a portal, um, or at the very least, it can summon something terrible from uh, the depths of time and space. Is what the story basically says. Um, this object re object rests in a metal box with a hinged lid, and there are um, designs on the box that show living uh, living creatures, but they appear to be aliens. Um, all of this sits on a, a column that is also filled with these alien designs or pictures. Um, and so, and but in, in the process of looking at all this, Blake uh, accidentally summons this this being through this portal, and he leaves the church um, because of this being basically showing up. And he he figures out that he he really shouldn't have gone there. Now this this creature can only go out in darkness. And so that's how it was basically trapped um, in the tower. And um, it doesn't like light, which is interesting. Um, but then sometimes when the, the city's power goes out during thunderstorms, the there are these um, loud crashes um, coming from the church and the surrounding area, uh, basically, which is this creature getting out of the church. Um, and then Blake, of course, hears all these sounds and these, um, hears about the locals contacting, uh, priests from other churches in the area. And, um, and then eventually there's, during one of these, um, outages, this creature is being drawn towards Blake's apartment or quarters. And um, he has these um, weird feelings like he is himself but not himself. And um, it's almost like he's this being is in contact with his mind and he's in contact with this being's mind. And um, he's eventually found, Blake is eventually found dead, staring out of the window of his apartment at the church with like a look of horror on his face, face, which is similar to the way he found the remains of that reporter. Um, and his last words uh, refer to, talk about basically he's able to see this creature. Um... And, uh, so yeah, that's, that's basically that story. Um, I just really think it's interesting, this whole idea of, <clears throat> of, um, devices that, 
can act as portals or can help call different things from one location to another. Um, and the way the darkness and the story, the descriptions of this thing basically being trapped in the, in the church during daytime anyway, when it's there, they're really interesting. Um, makes you wonder what people might have heard if there was more to the story. You know, if this was like a real thing, if people would have heard other sounds coming from the top of that church during the daytime. Um, and then of course, the, the, I thought that was really interesting with the power going out that basically sets this thing free. Um, especially during storms, even though it doesn't like the lightning during storms. But it is still able to be out. Um, so it's almost like natural light, natural energy light, I guess you could say. It doesn't bother it as much as, well, not even natural energy light. light. Basically, just lightning doesn't bother it as much as like sunlight does. Um, so... I thought that was a really interesting story. Well done in terms of just the suspense building up through the entire thing. Obviously, like I said, done a lot better than what I was able to do here. But um, I def definitely recommend it. Um, it's interesting because the, ha the, the, the title almost implies something like a ghost, but this creature does leave like scorch marks on physical objects. And it sounds like it's massive when it moves around, so it's not really, it's kind of, the title it kind of leads you one way, but it's something else. Or is it? I mean, that's the whole, that's another idea as well, is that maybe this is some kind of a alien, ghost-like alien kind of creature. So... So it was a it was an interesting fun story to read. Um, so I I really enjoyed it just for all those reasons. But um, but yeah, just again, the few the few are find. I I found this uh, audio book. It's the the um, the complete fiction. I found it on um on um the Google Play Store as an audio book for. Five bucks. I've heard before that you can find a lot of Lovecraft stuff on YouTube for free, but this book is arranged in all in one file and it has a table of contents. So you can literally pick any story and um, and go to that right away. And so I, I just really, for that price, it is really good for an audiobook, especially something that long. A lot of audiobooks. Can range from 15 bucks for medium sized ones to up to 30, 30 or so, or maybe even more. Um, so they're they're not not cheap, you know, uh, in terms of that. But so five bucks was really amazing. I'd um, definitely recommend checking it out if you if you um, are into audiobooks at all, you know, just for that. Um, that value of having that convenience, paying for that convenience, um, of having that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow. So yeah. See, um, hello, Matt, Matt, in the chat there. The real book has over 800 pages, and that sounds about right. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, just because the the audiobook is almost 48 hours long. So oh, um, I've I've gotten I've seen prices for Stephen King books that have been thirty hours long, that have been like around twenty thirty bucks. So I mean, obviously you're you're paying for the name as well in those cases too, but just an idea of of yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Matt. I um, and I love it. But it's, he's one of those writers where, like, I can only listen to one or two stories at a time. <laughs> um, so, 
Just because they're so intense. Um, I don't know. There's something to it that's different. And so maybe I'll get used to it more over time and be able to listen more at one time. But but yeah, so it's definitely it's helping out with this uh, review show. I mean, it's definitely providing a lot of material for that, and if nothing else. So, but um, so that's the first story that I wanted to review. Um, and I read, I listened to that one last week. Um, so, and then the other one I listened to just today. Uh, was called The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Innsmouth? Um, so, that was another one. And this one is almost, it's very different in one way that, that you'll see. One thing I'm noticing with a lot of these stories is that it's, it's, there's a pattern of a narrator telling a story about a strange situation that they found and found themselves in and how they were like an, an academic or a writer or basically not believing in anything strange at the start of the story and then weird things start to happen and then by the end of the story they're either um, changed for life either mentally, mentally or physically, or as in the case of that last story, you know, unfortunately, um, the character ends up dead. So that seems to be, I'm seeing a, pa a pattern there, but it's, I don't know. He, Lovecraft does it well enough where he, I, I'm not really, I'm not bored by that pattern yet. Doesn't, doesn't bother me yet. In a way, it's almost kind of like a fictional version of like um, extreme version of kind of I feel and um, like what I wish would happen to people that don't believe in any of the paranormal at all. Like I want them to have an experience, not not to the level of of Lovecraft. That would be that'd be cruel. That'd be uh, that, and then potentially deadly. But um. I, I I always like it when I hear about people that, in real life, that have experiences that just did not think any of the paranormal, anything strange could be, could actually be real. And then they have an experience, and now they don't know. Now, or now they do know. They, they think that they realize maybe there could be something out there. So, um, anyway, that's, uh... It's kind of like getting revenge, but without hurting anyone because it's fictional. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just that just came to mind there. But anyway, so um, I'll get on to this other story here. But uh, yeah, thank you all for being here and listening to me ramble on, ramble on about all this um, because. I do love sharing stories. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, Apple 890 says, I know what you mean, especially when they look at you like you're, you're crazy talking about it. Yeah, yep. It's it's just, um, yeah, you just want something to, to show up and not hurt them or not, not cause them any, you know, permanent damage you know or damage at all really just something to show up and say hey this stuff exists okay have a good day bye but uh but yeah yeah i'm glad i'm not the only one there with that so anyway um so let's get on to this next story here like i said it's called the shadow over innsmouth or innsmouth i'm terrible with pronunciations in some cases um so let's see here let's close the other one so i don't All right there we go so uh this was a little bit longer of a story so it may take a little bit longer to um to review it had actually had chapters to it 
Um, so let's see here. The narrator is um, Robert Olmsted. And, and uh, in the story, he explains how he um, conducted this secret investigation of a ruined town of Innsmouth in Massachusetts, which is a f former seaport, seaport um, and it's isolated from other towns by these marshlands. Um, and um, basically it's, it's um, Olmsted's story of his experiences in this area. Um, I believe it's even, he's basically telling of, or um, basically getting his words down to present to the government after his experiences. Um, because he goes there and he finds something pretty uh, terrifying and eventually escapes. Um, so, um, let's see here. It starts off with him going to this town. Um, he's basically um, interested in um, archaea or like in in architecture, and um, he's basically was in college at the time. And while he while he waits for the bus that's going to take him to Innsmouth, he um, talks to others in, in surrounding towns about this area and learns a little bit about the history of the, of the area. Um, and it basically sounds really odd, like superstitious. Uh, the town was uh, at one point a, um, profitable and it was even um, where ships were built um, during the colonial period. And the American Revolution, and uh, it, it uh, industrialized during the early 19th century, but then started to decline. Uh, and um, so, let's see here. There's um, I lost my spot. Uh, the the south. There's a merchant there named, huh, that's interesting, his last name is Marsh, who built a, a gold refinery that was, uh, pro that did well for a while. But it, still, the town kept deteriorating after riots and uh, strange um, sickness eliminated a lot of its residents in 1845. Uh, Marsh also founded a, a, a cult called the es Esoteric Order of Dagon, or Dagon, which became the town's main religion. Um, outsiders and government officials uh, and school inspectors are um, only allowed in there just to do their, their job and then basically they're, they're um, treated uh, basically just the town is hostile to any any outsiders. It reminds me of um, a little bit of the way things start to progress in the Tommyknockers. Once the characters in that that's another Stephen King novel I review, reviewed before. Once the the locals there start to change basically um, into these alien creatures, they don't they don't want any anyone from out of the town visiting. So, um, Olmsted gets there to this town and it finds it's, um, mostly deserted. And there are people, there are a lot of empty buildings, people that walk, um, strangely. They have, appear to have strange features on their heads, basically where, where their heads, that, like their heads have strange features, such as, um, flat noses and bulging, bulging staring eyes. Um, and the, the whole area basically stinks of, 
or reeks of dead fish. The only person in town that is seems to be normal is a grocery store clerk who had a transfer was transferred to the store in, in Innsmouth. Um even though he didn't want to go, but the, the, he didn't want to lose his job either, so he's still working there. And um, this uh, young guy, I think he's like a, even a teenager, gives um, Olmstead information on the general layout of the town. And the name of uh, another, ma another man, older man in the town, that might talk more about what's going on. And that is uh, Zadok Allen, who's um, who's basically known as a town town drunk. And so the narrator also hears from many people, including the store clerk, that um, just again the outsiders are not welcome, and and that strangers including government investigators have disappeared when they try to look too deep too deep into the what's going on in this town so Olmstead meets Z Zadok and it takes a while to get him talking um, but eventually Zadok does and explains that um, while tra uh, trading in the Caroline Islands, uh, Marsh, the the tra trade the trader or the merchant, discovers a uh, a tribe uh, who offer offers human sacrifices, and they don't really say what tribe or what what um much more detail than that. Um, but basically, this this group performs human sacrifices to a race of Immortal fish like humanoids known as the deep ones. And um the the survivors were left with no other choice. Oh shoot, I missed my spot again. Okay, I'm sorry. Um and um not only did these were their sacrifices, but apparently these deep ones were there, and um, the the different people that were part of this group actually mated with them, <laughs> and um, and so they they ended up having these hybrid offspring that look like regular people in childhood and early adulthood, but eventually they slowly change into deep ones themselves and they leave the surface to go underwater in these um under uh, these cities under the water basically again going deep going and they literally say that several times deep into the water when they are in the area now uh, when when things started to decline in the area the uh, esoteric order of Dagon performed similar sacrifices to these deep ones in exchange for wealth in the form of uh, massive amounts of fish and also uh, and our uh, unique jewelry, I guess from um, seems like it's from the water. Um, so basically. Eventually, the, these original people that performed these uh, sacrifices, they were found and eventually arrested, and the Deep Ones retaliated by um, by swimming up the Nanuxit, I'm not sure, uh, by a river, attacking the town and killing more than half of the population. Um, okay, that's where I was. Now, the survivors... Um, of this massacre basically felt they had to join this order of Dagon and continued where Marsh and, and his followers had left off at. Um, still basically mating with these, these deep ones. 
And um, the, once these people that are, well, that these hybrids are born, eventually, after they become young adults, they uh, go back underwater and supposedly live forever. And um, and they basically go to the city that's uh, underneath a uh, local reef <laughs> called Devil Reef. Um, and the town is now basically um, dominated by the grandson of that original merchant, uh, Marsh, uh, Barnabas Marsh, who is almost completely transformed into a deep one. And Zabok explains that these creatures have uh, designs on the surface world and have been planning the use of um, different technology, I believe, like different rituals and things, uh, to transform it. And as Zadok is, is telling almost at all this, he sees these strange waves approaching the dock and tells the um, Olmstead that they've been spotted. And he tells Olmstead to leave the town right away. Um, Olmstead is un unnerved. He's uneasy about all this. But he still can't believe that any of this can be real. So he leaves the um, the the coast, basically the water, the docks, and everything. And um, of course, after this happens, uh, Zadok is never seen again. Now, um, Olmstead does try to leave, uh, taking the same bus that was um, that brought him to this town, but he's told that it's experiencing engine trouble, so that the um, Olmstead has to stay in this hotel which he was told by people out of the town not to stay in and um but he has no choice because he's stuck there because there's, the bus isn't supposedly working um and while he's in his room and while he's trying to sleep he hears noises at his door as if someone is trying to get in so he escapes through a window and uh and then through the streets um and basically has to flee the town while all these people and hybrids and creatures are searching for him. And, um, and eventually he does escape. And he makes it towards railroad tracks. And um, he has to hide. And when he, when he finds this, these railroad tracks, and eventually he sees a group of these deep ones passing the road ahead of him. And at first he doesn't want to look, but then he can't help it. So basically, it's described. They're described as having gray, gray green skin, gray or green skin, fish-like heads with unblinking eyes, gills on their necks, and webbed hands. And they keep, um, talk in this unintelligible croaking sound that these voices and. Um, he almost said actually faints and wakes up the next day alone and unharmed. And um, that's where he eventually goes to alert the government about what all this, or all this that happened. And, and um, after that, the government does something strange in that they, um, they, they basically invade the town and arrest and, and detain a lot of the town's residents. And then they also send a, send a submarine to dor torpedo Devil's Reef, which um, the mistake, uh, the, the press um, mistakes as um, prohibition liquor raids. But um, anyway, so. After all this happens, uh, Olmstead eventually researches his ancestry and finds he might be he might be related to Marsh, to the Marsh family. Um, so, 
and of course um there's a history of different members of this family once they start changing to unfortunately um to kill themselves to stop the change that happens and um so he, he starts having dreams of his great grandmother or his grandmother and her her ancestors who are still in under the water under this reef in the city that was damaged but not destroyed and they explain that the old ones will, will stay underwater for for the time being but eventually they'll um return to invade the the world the service world for the the tribute and this is quotes for the tribute the great cthulhu craved again linking these stories together um and so he basically after this last dream almost at himself wakes up and finds that he's becoming um becoming one of these creatures and eventually he does what what his earlier relatives have done um let's see here oh wait no i'm sorry um so i'm sorry i got that wrong because that's right so the there was a history in this, this family of of um the people basically not wanting to change so they end up um killing themselves which is dark of course but um at the end of the story he decides he's not going to do that instead he's just going to basically embrace the change and he suffers a mental breakdown but he decides to um find his cousin who is even further transformed than he is and um break him out from a sanitarium in canton and then he decides that they'll both go and live underwater under under the the, the um, in the ocean or in the in the water there i can talk um and just join the rest of their family who has never died since they've been down there so that's basically that story again a lot more details in it um but uh it's amazing again written so well overall and uh so i really enjoyed that one i listened to that one today and um so yeah but let's see here okay yeah so that's basically basically it um so that's the story and uh Thank you all uh, for listening. See you all there in chat. I see. Uh, looks like we got uh, someone new to the new to the, to the listening to the stream live. Hello there, Big Y. I see you. And thank you all for being here. Um, but yeah, that I, that story really was quite the quite the the piece there. Um, and the ending was just that was uh. An amazing ending after all that happening so makes you wonder if they did if Olmstead did go back underwater and find that city would they would he be welcomed or not because he did try to he did escape so um but that uh there we go that did it i'm glad that the those two stories made a um filled out enough time for a show so um now tomorrow i'm really excited for tomorrow's show because it's going to be part two of um our trilogy on mountains and um it's going to be talking about the eastern u.s uh big y says hello and this reminds me of the and i'm sorry if, i'm not sure how i'm going to say that so i'm going to not say that, but a, um, a tribe from the Amazon, a group from the Amazon, they can turn into pink dolphins. 
and people, and they walk backwards. Interesting. Um, so yeah, it's it was. Um, I'm looking forward to to the show tomorrow. Um, the mountains thing is really, really. Um, there's a lot there. And uh, again, it's it's going to be a trilogy. So we've got two more weeks. We got this week and next week, next Friday. And um, and then we're going to go a couple different places after that. So um, thank you all for being here. And uh, I will hopefully catch you all tomorrow night on the next episode of South Pseudo Paranormal. Take care.